Now, without further delay, I'd like to turn today's live meeting over to your presenter, Juval Lawi. Juval, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. We're going to spend the next hour or so discussing the process involved in planning, estimating, and tracking .NET, progress, .NET uh, projects. Most of you know me as a technology specialist, but long ago in a galaxy far away, I was actually a manager. And what I'm going to show you is actually just the planning and tracking part of a much more complex or comprehensive, shall we say, component-oriented development process that I have developed that you have to use when you're actually developing with .NET. You simply cannot stare into the fire of component-based technologies without a mature development process supporting you. And this is actually just the highlight of the planning and tracking portion of it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to build applications out of components, gluing them together, kind of like Lego bricks, so we get the extensibility, the reuse, modular applications, and so on. I'm using the term component relatively loosely. A component can actually be anything from a .NET class all the way up to, shall we say, uh, a well-defined, uh, concise assembly. Assembly in .NET is just a packaging unit. It is not a component. And actually, the Microsoft terminology is quite overloaded and misleading in that respect. However, if you only have a single class or a class with a supporting class inside an assembly, you can actually treat an assembly as a component. But I believe that the strict definition is actually a single .NET class. This is actually a departure from the traditional object-oriented way of the world, where actually you have classes, and separately from that, you have um, binary components, such as COM, that basically used to deploy the uh, classes. Incidentally, moving into uh, a service-oriented architecture, you can actually take this slide deck and replace the word component with the word service, and you pretty much get the same analogy. What I'm going to do, I'm going to address the key process area involving project planning staffing, the product life cycle itself, the overall application life cycle, the stages in which you deliver it, the life cycle inside an individual component, the component integration plan. And we're going to try and get a handle on the progress when you're using components. Now, the underlying problem with component-oriented development is the dark side of this slide. And the problem is, Yes, you do get the modularity, the extensibility, the reuse, and so on. But you also get an inherent degree of complexity the moment you deal with components. There's simply no way of avoiding it. There's just more moving parts. There's more distributed work, more developers involved, more interaction points. As a result, complexity grows. And the question is, how do you get a handle on that complexity? And so. We're still, dealing about, we're still talking about planning, and I'm going to talk about staffing. But before I talk about staffing, I have to ask you a few questions about design. And my question is, is this a good design? Suppose your system is just one big thing. Is that a good design? And the answer is no. It doesn't even matter what the system actually does. We all know this is actually a bad design. One big thing, one big class, one big component for a system is a, bit, is a bad design. So my next question is, is this a good design? And we look at it and we're saying, no, a million little things running all over the place is actually a bad design. And my next question to you is, is this a good design? And you're saying probably, well, it's probably better than what you saw before. And how about this one? Is this a good design? Now you're saying, no, it's actually worse than what you just showed us. Now, the reason you were able to tell me or say in your head it's good or bad is because you're doing this in your head. You may not even be aware you're actually doing this in your head, but this is what you're doing in your head. Whenever you design a system, you're trying to balance a number of components with the cost of developing the components and integrating them together. Now, let's look at the system that had one big thing. So if you have one big thing, you are in the curve somewhere around here, meaning in this area where you have very few components. And so the cost, which is actually the blue line, the cost to implement each component is actually huge. 
However, there's no cost to interface because the system is just one big thing. It is what it is. You're here. There's nothing to interface. A system that has a million little things running all over the place is somewhere around here where the cost per component is actually very small because you're dealing with very granular components. But the cost to interface them is absolutely huge because you have to stitch all those components together. It turns out that the blue line and the red line are actually nonlinear because complexity is not linear with size. We all know that if we have a, a graph of dots, the number of lines connecting the dots is somewhere around n square of the dots. And so the lines are actually not linear. Now, in any given system, you pay for two things. You pay for the cost of implementing the components, and you pay for the cost of integrating them together. And as a result, the actual software implementation cost is the sum of the blue line and the red line. And this is what you see in the green line. And guess what? The green line has an area of minimal cost. So whenever you design a system, you want to aspire to be in this area of the graph, where the components are not too big and not too small, not too many and not too few, not too coupled and not too decoupled, just right. And the question is, how do you get to this area in the graph? I'll give you a hint, this is still under the headline of staffing. And the way to get to this area of the graph is you hire an architect and then it's his problem. Now, I firmly believe that not having a skilled architect is the number one technology risk in any project. It's usually much larger than the technology risk itself. And so when you're about to staff a .NET project, the most important thing is you must get a skilled .NET architect someone who has experience in actually decoupling the system and decomposing it into components which are just right, not big, not too small, and so on. Now, you're saying that this is such a crucial task, how about we get two architects or three architects? Well, it turns out that architecture is a task that basically more firepower doesn't expedite it. You very quickly run into the nine women, one month baby problem. And so, there's just no avoiding it. You have to invest upfront the time requiring to do the analysis and the architecture. Even in a big project, a single architect is usually good enough. If you have too many architects, you also run into a problem of arguments and obviously do it this way and that way and, and discussions and so on. In really large projects, it's actually perhaps beneficial to have a senior architect and a junior architect or an apprentice somebody that learns from the master how to do things, the apprentice will also do all the design diagrams, the class hierarchies, all the mini labor involved. It's actually a great way of also training the next generation architect. But by and large, don't have more than one architect, even on a big project. So what the architect does is the architect is decomposing the system into the components. Once you have the breakdown of the system into components, you need to assign them to developers. Assigning components should, to developers should be done in the one-to-one -one ratio, meaning don't have two components assigned to a single developer at a point in time and don't have two developers working on a single component in a single point in time. It's quite all right once a developer is done with a component moving on to the next component, but at any point in time, there's just one-to-one -one ratio of developers to components. And it's very important to actually keep it that way because if you have two developers working on a single component, they will constantly step on each other's toes. I have this checked out, and you have this one checked out. Do this, now I have to do that. And if you have a developer working on two components at a time, that developer is likely to be the bottleneck of everybody else who is actually de de depending on those components. So it becomes a hotspot. So one-to-one -one is really a good idea. I also believe that you shouldn't uh, span assemblies across teams. Even though actually, technically you can actually do it, it's impractical in a management point of view. Now, why do we actually like a good design? We like a good design, such as what we actually see here with that, because we have just about the right number of, com of components and interaction between those components. And we all know that if we have too many or too few and so on, we're beginning to skew into the areas of cost and integration, which are not in the minimal area in the green graph. And as a result, it's a bad design. 
Now, if you accept that you actually map components to developers in a one-to-one -one ratio, what you actually see is that the interaction between the team members is therefore isomorphic to the interaction between the individual components. Now, just like a good design is a design that has minimized the interaction between the components and the components themselves are, loose coupling, are loosely coupled, a team which is mapped isomorphically to those components will also be a good team. It will be an effective team because such a team will actually minimize the interaction between the team members. You would have loosely coupled between the team members. You minimize the communication overhead. A design that actually has tightly coupled set of components would have tightly coupled team members. And as a result, you're going to spend more time in meetings addressing the issues and there's going to be friction. And if somebody breaks something, things explode all over the place and efficiency goes down. And so what I have found is that a good design is not just crucial for the long-term maintainability of the system. A good design is actually crucial for simply fast time to market because that gives you the optimal team layout and interaction inside the team. It took me a long while to realize it actually goes both ways. Meaning, it doesn't actually matter if you have a good design. If you have a good design on the whiteboard and you assign it to Fred and Barney, and Fred doesn't talk to Barney because they don't like each other, this area in your design is going to be weak. And so when you actually assign the work to developers, make sure you take into account the intra-team interactions and put developers who work well together on more coupled components. The next task is let's look at the staffing distribution. How do you distribute your staff and your firepower over the duration of the project? Now, the team should actually comprise of a core team and developers and QA resources. And so the core team has a project manager, a product manager, and an architect. And you can see those with the color chart uh, to the right that the core team basically stays throughout the lifespan of the project. This is actually from an actual project I managed a few years ago. And you can see that the manager, the product manager, and the architect were on board in day one. I just normalized it to January 1st. Now, the job of the product manager is basically interfacing with the customer and formulating the use cases and the requirements the architect needs to analyze that and break it into components, and the product manager shields uh, the architect and later on the developers as well from the overall organizational noise and the pounding from other managers and other teams and so on. Now, architecture is a time-consuming contemplative work, and you cannot actually expedite it by having more architects working on it, and you can't expedite it by saying, you're only going to spend three weeks on it. No. If you have a three-month project, spending three weeks on it wouldn't get the job done. It doesn't matter how much you try. It takes time to look at it this way and that way, try and this way and try and that way, and do the diagram this way, and realizing, getting the insight, that actually it's this manifestation of that component and this interface, it all takes time. So once the architect is done doing the breakdown into components, you actually can do two things. You can actually do also a much better estimation of the overall effort, which is the second half of what I'm going to show you. And you can actually go to upper management and say, here's how much it's actually going to cost us, because now we understand what is in front of us. But once you have the breakdown into components, you can actually assign it to developers. So at some point, your staff consumption spikes up, where you actually start assigning the work to developers, and also to configuration management and system testers and QA resources. And at this area of the curve, people simply work on a project. At some point, when most of the work is actually done, all you're really doing is system testing and perhaps integration with other systems, you can actually let go of the developers. And the developers phased out of this project are actually going to be phased in and ramped up in another project. But know that the core team actually stays throughout the project. Now, it's very important that you avoid upfront staffing with good decomposition. What does it mean? In almost every organization I go to, and I, and I have my fair share of seeing organizations, 
I see that managers have actually incentives for doing a bad design and not doing the correct thing. And the rationale for it goes something like this. Imagine you're a project manager, and this is actually a dream project where your manager calls you in and says, we decided to go with uh, version 1.0 of uh, the next generation. The board approved it. Money is not a problem at all. In fact, um, go and hire now everybody you need. On top of that, here is the requirements. They are um, already spec'd out in UML activity diagrams, and they're never going to change. I mean, if we're dreaming, might as well, right? Requirements are never going to change. You have one year, go ahead and succeed. So clearly, uh, this is a dream scenario. Might as well dream that you can actually get a good architect on day one of the project, so you get a good architect. Now what? Well, now you have to actually allow the architect to break the system into components. The problem is, this takes as much as 20 or 30% of the overall duration of the project. And it's 20% if, if you already know the domain and the architect knows the domain and understand the use cases. It's more than that if the system is complex, you also need to ramp up on the domain knowledge as well. And so if you hire just the architect, it would actually look bad on you as a manager. The reason is you're saying, I need to actually allow the architect to break down the system into components, and there's actually no point in hiring any developers because I can't assign them anything to do anyway, so why waste uh, the effort? And so if I'm your manager and I'm walking down the aisles, I see basically empty cubicles. At the corner there's this guy mumbling to himself and doing drawings on whiteboards, but I don't see any progress. Uh, clearly, he didn't follow my instruction to go ahead and forge and simply build the project because I told you that you should hire whoever you want and you're not a good manager. So to mitigate that, what the manager is going to do is is going to hire all the developers on day one as well. Now, there's simply no nothing for them to do yet. And so now when I'm as the uh, manager's manager walking down the aisles, I'm simply seeing developers playing foosball and taking two and a half hours lunch break and reading blogs. At the corner, there's this guy mumbling to himself, uh, drawing on a whiteboard, but I don't see what is going on. Uh, clearly, you are a bad manager. You do not know how to manage. You do not know how to delegate tasks, and uh, there's no authority going on. You are a bad manager. So to mitigate that, what the manager is going to do is is basically going to do a crude decomposition. He's going to say, well, we have user interface. Joe is doing user interface. We have database. Mary is doing uh, database. We have uh, some system. He's doing system, and so on. So, I mean, it's like... Hand-waving architecture and decomposition, user interface, database, system, interfaces, interop, blah, 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 sending it to the developers, go ahead and do it. Now, of course, if you're doing it this way, the decomposition is very good, and it's totally suboptimal, and you're definitely not in the area in the curve where uh, you minimize the cost of implementing the components and the interaction between them, but hell, you know, at least you're actually doing uh, a damn good effort at it. And when now when your manager is walking down the aisles, he sees everybody is coding and everybody is spending time in passionate meetings arguing the issues that we have with the interactions between the components. And of course, you're, not, you're going to actually miss a schedule because you have a very inefficient team, but you know everybody is, is flipping the schedule. It's software, right? So you're actually going to look good to your managers. And so in most companies I visit, uh, managers have actually incentives for not doing design. And it's very important to actually talk to your customers and educate them about the lure of the crude upfront decomposition, how horribly dangerous that actually gets. And um, you, you can actually be persuasive and try and uh, um, do it correctly. And so once you have the breakdown into the components, what is the overall life cycle of the project? The life cycle I think that best fits .NET projects is stage delivery. Stage delivery means you're not going to try and deliver all the requirements at day one or at basically at, uh, um, at, at, at the release date. Trying to deliver all features and all requirements at one point in time is destined to failure for a number of reasons. First of all, Requirements change throughout the project. 
Second, there's just no way that with the amount of resources and time that you actually get, you can actually do everything. Everybody, everywhere is basically understaffed, overworked, under schedule. It's not going to happen. So what you're trying to do, you're trying to come up with a life cycle that defensively allows you to accommodate those things. And the, there's, what you're trying to do is you're saying, I'm going to have stages, and at each stage, I'm basically going to deliver a piece of the system or basically the system with a few more features. At any given moment in time, I can actually deliver it or move on to the next phase. And so if at any point in time you are actually out of money or out of time, you simply exit and you do a release. So the stage delivery actually starts with two preliminary stages. The preparation phase is where you assemble the team, the project manager, the product manager, the architect. You gather the requirement and so on. Here's where you do the requirement analysis and the top-level design. This takes about 20 to 30% of the overall effort. And then you're ready to start doing your stages. And so you must maintain as an axiom that at any given moment in time, you have a releasable system. And you can actually prove by induction it's possible to do. If you haven't started yet, then you deliver basically nothing, which is actually, you know, there's no bugs, there's nothing. And you basically define that the features you're about to deliver are actually zero, so it works. Then you're saying maybe let's just, let us just implement all the interfaces in some sort of an emulator or simulator. Then you go out and you release it. Now, the releases of the internal stages can actually be artificial. It doesn't have to go to an external customer, but you have to go through the motion of doing a release. Then you add more capabilities, and again, you can check out and release, or you can move to another stage, check out and release, or another stage, check out and release. This life cycle is very defensive. At any moment in time, you can check out and release something. It may not be the best system, but if you're out of time, out of budget, this actually is good enough. It also helps to reduce the risk, because if you can convince your customers and your managers that this is something which they can live with, they can see progress throughout the release point, throughout the stages, you build confidence, and um, any kind of changes in the requirements, you can start negotiating, we'll do it in stage uh, five, not in stage four, and so on. Now, the problem that we have is that managers and customers do not care about software engineering. They only care about features. And you are building systems out of components. And so each individual component doesn't actually implement any particular feature. It's a building block. And the question is, how do you integrate all those components into something that does implement features? And how do you plan it ahead? And so if you have a set of interacting components, there is some sort of dependencies between them. So what you need to plot, you need to plot the dependency graph between the visual components. Now, the graph should actually be a non-cyclic graph, meaning nobody should actually depend on something that depends on itself. And that means that graph is going to be a tree-like graph, and it's going to have leaves. And you start implementing the components bottom-up. And so here's a potential uh, interaction uh, graph or basically dependency graph between individual components. And so in orange, you see the individual components, and in green, you see the integration steps. Every time you take two components and integrate them together, that's basically a milestone. And so later on, you're going to impose on top of that your project's uh, Gantt chart, where the milestones are actually your integration points. And so you start implementing the components bottom-up. What you're trying to avoid, you're trying to avoid the Big Bang Syndrome, where you have a bunch of developers working on a bunch of components, and you bring them all together, and you try and integrate them. That's a recipe for failure. That never works. The only way for you to actually do it is using constant integration. As you go along, you incrementally build the system and integrate the, the individual parts. You never actually try and integrate the, the entire system. Doing it bottom-up uh, with integration points is very risk reduction oriented because any incompatibility between the individual components is discovered early on. 
on a daily basis, you do a build of the evolving system and you test it. The test can actually be something very simple uh, using a smoke test, but you always flush water through the pipes once a day. Now, know that with the integration plan you see in here, you can actually have, you can start working on it from this end, but also from this end. There's nothing wrong with doing that. If you have more developers, you can actually start chewing on it from different directions. If you have things which are kind of like on a tangent or you implement it in later stages, it's like a tangent, you go outside and you do it. At some point in time, you're actually going to end up with a system. System is what I'm calling the first integration point that actually has system level features on it because up to now, the individual components never had any features on them. It was doing some data access, some hardware control. You never saw features there. Here we start seeing features. At this level, you can actually start doing system testing as well. And so again, this particular interaction integration graph is from a project I managed a few years ago. Here's another example of an integration plan from a project I helped uh, a recent customer with. This is from stage uh, zero to, I think, uh, one and one and a half. Here is uh, stages uh, two and three of the same project. And as you can see, the graphs never have a cycle in them. And um, you basically plot it out this way, and you can actually see where the critical path is. And so if you look at this graph of interacting components, there is a path through it which actually is the longest as far as duration. That's going to be the duration of the project until the completion of that particular stage. It doesn't matter if there's a faster way of getting there. If you have to go through here to do it, then this is what it is. Every component itself has its own miniature lifestyle or life cycle. Now, when dealing with components, remember that slide where I showed you the components uh, put together like Lego bricks? The problem with dealing with components is the moment you say the word components, you set, you set complexity. And it's going to be the same also when dealing with services. Component-based systems or service-oriented architectures inherently involve a degree of distribution. There's more moving parts and so on. There's also issues involving the connectivity itself, the plumbing, the security, the remote calls, and so on. The inherent complexity of the plumbing and the application is such that if the building block itself, the component, is not rock solid, you'll never be able to actually debug a problem. You cannot actually debug a business logic uh, bug at the system level. At the system level, you will only be able to address plumbing issues, security issues, remoting issues and such. You won't be able to address individual business logic issues. And so your individual components must be rock solid. So the question is, how do you get a rock solid component? And here is a component, an individual component life cycle. Every component starts with a requirement spec. Once you have a requirement spec, you review it. And then you can actually do two things. You can start developing a test plan for that component. Remember, a test plan is done from the requirements, not from what you actually developed. A test plan's goal is to prove the component doesn't work, not to prove that it actually works. And after you have the requirements, you need to basically start designing and construction. The thing is, I don't believe that you can actually look at the requirement spec and immediately go to design. And in any other engineering discipline, nobody's doing it either. In civil engineering, somebody is building a mock-up of the building. In um, electrical engineering, they're building a mock-up and so on. So you need to actually get your hands dirty. Do some construction. Try a few angles. Maybe we can do it with the queue here. We can do it with Emerson queue. We can do it like this. We can do it like that. Try a different angle on it. Get a better understanding of the underlying problem and the approaches of implementing the requirements. Once you have that done, it's basically it's throwaway code in that respect. It's not really prototyping or anything. It's just some investigation. You can start doing the little design. Little design is where you start breaking down the components into methods and parameters, and you document it all in a nice compiled HTML file, just like MSDN. You review the design. Then you start construction. 
on parallel to building the component itself, you build a test client for it. The test client allows you to do white box testing of the individual component. Every line of code that you write must be worked through using the test client. So you add a method in here, you add a button to exercise the method. You're done with the construction, you do the code review, and then you go into integration and testing based on a test plan for the component and integration with other components. And that's the life cycle you follow for an individual component. That's how you get that rock solid quality by following this procedure. If you start cutting corners here, you're not going to end up with, um, with, with a rock solid component and eventually the system itself would be unworkable. Now, most of the activities here are actually done by the developer, including writing the SRS and writing the test plan for the components. It is not the job of the quality control guy to write test plans for individual components. QA guys write system level testing. They do not write component level testing. Now, once you run the system into components, and given the various activities inside each component, you can actually start estimating the effort involved in implementing those components and the overall system. There's various ways of doing estimation. In fact, there's there's even tools that you can actually use for doing the estimation. This is a screenshot from a tool called Estimax. It gives pretty good results, by the way. And I've used it in several projects and collated that to actual results. Results were good. But you can also use the broadband Delphi by having the team members participate in the estimation itself. And again, I have pretty good results with doing that as well. Whenever you estimate an effort, itemize all the activities. Because if you ask somebody, how long will it take you to build this component, and it's going to say uh, three weeks, he's probably talking three weeks of coding. Was he talking about writing the SRS, the test plan, the uh, code review, the integration? Well, did they factor in learning curves? And so on. And so when you estimate the effort, break it down as much as you can into all the life cycle activities of individual components. In fact, have a table per component, we actually estimate those things. After you do that, you take all of those and you simply put them in a long shopping list, all the various activity components inside or in, the, in your application and the various uh, estimation. Once you have that, you know how long it will take to actually do something. The order in which you actually do that something is the integration plan. Remember the dependencies between the components. The next question is, how do you plan the order of things, and how do you track the progress? Now, the problem with tracking progress in a component-based system is that you have a bunch of developers working on a bunch of components. Each component is in a different phase of completion, and some components are already done, and if I were to ask you, where are you in the overall effort of the project? Are you 72% down or 52% down, you can't actually tell that by actually glancing on what people are doing. And so most developers will give you a flat, uh, uh, polite line like saying, we're 80% done. Anytime somebody is telling you 80% done, translate that into, I have no idea, I've got the foggiest idea where I am, it's just a nice guess. Don't, it's probably plus minus 100% anyway. What I'm going to show you next is a mechanical process for both tracking where you are and also refining your plan to the point that you can actually get incredible precision in uh, the tracking and the planning of your project. And so remember that what you have now is a list of all your components. You have the estimated effort per individual components. You have the order in which you are going to do the components. And the order is a product of both the integration plan the critical path through the integration plan and your available resources. Because if you have limited resources, you simply move along the critical path. But if you have additional resources, you assign them into the other leaves of the integration plan. And the question is, how do you actually allocate that into months and days and so on? And so here's an example. Suppose you have a set of activities in your project. Some activities are mapped one-to-one -to, -one to components. Some of them are more abstract, like architecture or system testing. 
So here you have activities. You have architectures, you have database component, user interface component, some control component, queue component, and so on. Here is the estimated effort of that particular component. And so you can see that you estimated the user interface component is going to be 40 days, and so on. If you sum it all up, you're going to see that you estimated this whole project as 200 work days. Right? It's not necessarily calendar days, simply work days. In general, whenever you're doing uh, project tracking, the only thing that you actually track is time. Time is your currency. Now, if 200 days is actually 100% of the overall effort and, and, and value of the project, if you finish the user interface component in 40 days, you actually earned 20% of the overall effort. And so this is called earned value. And so here you see the earned value of that particular activity or component, what it contributes to the overall project. Now the scope of every component, remember you have your individual life cycle with the various activities of that particular component. And so for example, this is some kind of uh, um, component you have to do uh, little requirement, little design, test plan, construction, documentation, and so on. And here is the weight you attribute for that particular phase of the activity. Now, you could actually try and optimize and say, for user interface components, little requirements are 15%, but for database access, it's only 10%. Or you could say, requirements for every component is always 30%. Or you could say, I have five phases, and therefore this is 20% regardless. It actually doesn't matter what you choose. As long as you have something which is consistent and you apply it across, if you have enough activity and enough components, the, you know that basically the sum of errors is less than the error of the sum, and as a result, it would actually uh, cancel each other out. So choose something, like requirement is always 20%, and little design is always 20% or something, and just stick with it and just go with it across all components. And so here's the individual activity for a particular component. Now, suppose you're done with little design and the test plan. And so if you have requirements, design, and test plan, you basically have 45% of that particular component. So if that particular component is 45%, it's actually 45% of the earned value of that particular component to the overall effort. And so you can actually come up with this summation table where you're saying this user interface component was 20% from the overall effort, and I'm 45% down of that component, you multiply this two and you get 9%. You repeat that for all the rest of them, and you get the accumulative earned value of the overall project, and this particular point, you're 40.25% down of the overall uh, project. And the amazing thing is that doing it this way is actually very easy. So although at first glance, tracking progress of a component-based system looks like a daunting task because you have no idea where you are across developers, across components, because it is already componentalized to such a degree, because it's already broken down into, it lends itself very well into earned value tracking. Now this is actually 40.25% at a particular point in time. If you do it a week from today, you're gonna to get a different measure. So what you can do next is you can start filling up those tables on an ongoing basis and actually start plotting it. And you can get graphs that look like this. Here we see dates, or basically calendar time. Here we see percent of completion. The blue line represents your project plan. Now remember, from your integration plan, you know the order in which you're doing things. From the estimation, you know how long it's going to take. Your resource allocation tells you where is the critical path and what you're going to do on the side. This is enough to actually go and build a Gantt chart. You build a Gantt chart, and that's nice because managers like Gantt chart. The, program, the problem with the Gantt chart, it's not a tracking tool. Gantt charts are merely elaborate calendars. What you really want to see is the blue line. You want to see what's your planned progress in percentage over time. So if this is your projected completion date, by this date, you're going to be 100% done. That's great. And so what is the shape of the blue line? Now, if the blue line is basically straight, 
it means constant resources applied efficiently over time. If the blue line is actually something that looks like this, then I have a big question about what happens here. What is the miracle that happens somewhere around here that suddenly everybody becomes so productive? So merely by looking at the blue line, at the blue plan progress line, I can immediately say if the program, if the if the plan makes sense or not. And you simply can't get this degree of making sense or not by looking at the Gantt chart. Now, typically, I have to tell you that a plan progress line would actually um, be in some sort of an S curve, meaning we probably look something like this, where at the beginning you only have the core team working on the project, the architect, the product manager, the project manager, and only when you actually ramp up with developers and testers, you actually get more progress going on. And then you're moving into system testing, you start releasing resources into other projects. So it has the tendency to look like an S, but a very mild S. Don't make it, you know, because if the first derivative of the blue line is actually too, too, uh, uh, too great, then it means something is wrong. That is the blue line. Now, remember that here you have measurement points. So let's say on a weekly basis, you fill up this table and you actually see where you are. This is what you see in the green line here. And so the green lines are actually points of progress. And so the green line means what you've actually managed to accomplish as opposed to the blue line, which is what you were supposed to accomplish. Now, suppose a developer worked for five days um, on a task. Suppose the developers worked for 10 days on a task that uh, should have taken five days to accomplish. Quite a common scenario, right? And so the question now becomes, how do you track what you spent as well, not just what you actually managed to accomplish? And so you also have to trace effort. And effort is basically the red line in here, the asterisk. And so what you can actually start asking is, let's start plot the progress versus the effort. And so tracing Effort is actually very easy. Joe came to work, worked for five days. I trace, uh, I plot basically five days on Joe. Now, whether Joe or not actually accomplished anything in that is based on the uh, metrics that we had in here. Now, remember that each individual component has its own life cycle. Now, the exit criteria for those items is binary. Are you done with requirements, yes or no? Are you done with design, yes or no? And how do you know somebody is done with design? They pass the digital design review, pure and simple. What you want to avoid is you want to avoid the phenomena that if you ask developers where they are, 90% of the time they're going to say we're 90% done. By having binary exit criteria, you basically have another table in here, that, another column in here that says 0 or 1. Only when they actually meet the exit criteria, you give them the credit, or you give them basically the earned value for, for what they did. So if somebody worked for five days on something, they can still get zero credit for it as far as progress, but you still charge five days of effort. And so what you actually have here is, is trace the progress line versus the effort line. Now, if the in ideal circumstances, the green line, the red line, and the blue line are all going to basically converge and be the same line. That's great. And of course, if that happens, Peter Pan is going to marry Snow White. In the real world, that's, there's always divergence. And typically, the classic divergence is you see the green line under the blue line, basically progress under plan, and effort over plan, meaning the, you spend more than what you planned and you achieve less than what you planned, right? That means you have to take a corrective action. Now, there's various corrective actions you can take. You could reduce the scope of the project. You could negotiate a new deadline. You can do any, any number of, of corrective actions. But the one thing you don't do is don't just uh, say, OK, that's my, my gunshot said I'm going to be here, so I'm going to be here. No, that's not how you do it. Now, you can take it one step further. And what you can do is you could actually run a regression on the green line. And what you can do is you could say, when the green line reaches 100%, which is somewhere, somewhere around here, 
That's my actual projected completion date. I don't care if the blue line said I'm going to complete in here. My actual throughput, what I was actually able to accomplish, is actually here. And now you have your planned, uh, your basically your new planned uh, completion date. Now you can also do a regression on the red line, and you could say, if I keep plotting that, when that actually hits my planned completion date, that's going to be my actual uh, cost. And so here's, by the way, um, let me just look for. Uh, Here is, by the way, the um, regression lines. And you can see that um, the progress line basically states that this is a new completion date. And if you go with that vertically and you plot it here, that's going to be your overrun as far as cost. Now, you can actually start doing that pretty early on in the project. So 10% in, 20% in, you always know where you are and you can project completion and effort cross developers, cross components, take those numbers and go to your managers and present the facts. Now, if you're doing this on a weekly basis, you demonstrate an enormous degree of control and you can actually build trust and you can negotiate things. Now, a project plan is not the initial Gantt chart and that was it. Once you have those numbers, you immediately go and you revise the project plan because what you want to do is you want to keep the three lines converge. And so this is from an actual project I managed a few years ago. And you can see me riding the bull here, trying to always take corrective action. This is why the blue line is kind of like zigzagging and so on, because I was taking corrective action to match always the blue line to what my team was actually capable of producing and how much I could actually spend. So you always take corrective action. Here are, by the way, a few other examples. This is from a project uh, with a customer of mine. You can see that uh, you have a few integration points. This is uh, the first stages. Um, now, the more items you have in the project, uh, the more smooth the, uh, the smoother the blue line is actually going to be. Here is another example from uh, uh, another project. Now, if you actually follow doing that, and you put all these things in Excel, you actually become a two-minute manager because all you have to do is simply spend three minutes every Friday afternoon, it doesn't take more than three minutes, to fill up your work for five days on a database component. Boom, five days for effort. Did they accomplish anything? No, zero. Mary worked on that, we exit requirements. I give her credit for that. And you immediately look at the graphs and you know immediately what to do in the project. In fact, I have isolated some six classic scenarios of situation between the green line, the blue line, and the red line. And when I'm doing this, like I said, this webcast is uh, really the highlight of a whole day that I have on, on development process. And in that, day I go, and in that day, I actually go through the different uh, symptoms or diseases that um, a project can have, over, overestimating, underestimating, sandbagging, this, that, and the corrective action you can actually do based whether the green line is over the blue line and so on. Let me show you uh, um, an Excel spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is just a template that you can use for uh, tracking progress that way. It's, you can see the various activities. You can see the various estimation. Basically, it's just, I just put in uh, three days for which it doesn't matter. And here you can see the various measurement points. And each date, you either give zero or one for a particular task. Here is the project plan. And basically, you can see the various activities and the various dates in which they're actually going to be accomplished. And this is actually built automatically from this spreadsheet. Here is the actual progress based on the actual project plan. So the spreadsheet calculates the blue graph, basically, the end value of the various activities over time, basically the planned end value, the blue line. And it also builds for you uh, this graph where you can see the uh, planned progress and you can see a few measurement points. It also automatically does the regression as well. The spreadsheet is pretty complex. It's probably the, the, one of the most complex spreadsheets I ever worked on. 
But, you know, suspend three days on it. It doesn't matter. Maintaining it is absolutely nothing. It merely goes in here, and you say 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. You spend two minutes on it, and you're basically done. Let me go back to the slides. And so when dealing with a .NET-based project, and when you're planning ahead, you have to look into how you're going to assign components into developers, your overall staffing strategy, your distribution of staff over the developers. You can only do that, of course, once you have a good decomposition of the product into components. You have your overall life cycle of the project, which is stage delivery. You have an individual component life cycle. From your integration plan, you build your gun chart, basically from that, you build your plan progress line. You move on into building your earned value arts that gives you the plan progress, and you plot on top of that the progress and the effort. You use simple regression to actually project completion date and completed effort. By the way, if you actually early on see that you're going to be 50% over budget, now you have actually the numbers to go and try and ask for additional recs, of course. And basically take a corrective action, right? So it's part of the symptoms you have also a list of uh, corrective action. And that's uh, all we can talk about today because our time is up. Let me move back to uh, the server slide. Alison? Yes, thank you. You should now see a survey in the slide area. Your feedback is valuable to us, so please take a moment to fill out the survey prior to logging out. And if you do have a question, just to ask a text question, click on the Ask a Question button in the lower right-hand corner of your question and answer panel. Looks like we do have one text question, Jabal. Okay, let me see the question. Control Q, right? Correct. Yes, I'll, of course, I'm going to post to the RD uh, website. I'm going to give to Eileen to post to the RD website the spreadsheet uh, template. And um, I'll see what I can actually scrub from some internal documents we have at iDesign about symptoms as to how to. Um, What's the corrective action based on the if the blue line is over the red line and so on and those things? Okay, that should do it for text questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the audio portion of today's Microsoft Live meeting. You may now disconnect from audio, but feel free to stay online to complete the survey. We do appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much and have a great day.